Father, I ask your blessings upon Sue that as she's prepared her heart and her mind for, for this moment, we know that you will use her mightily, <coughs> that the words that we hear from Sue will be as they were from you, and they will be a means of challenge, a means of encouragement, and a means of leading us forward in you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So um, we're still in Hebrews and I'm speaking this morning from Hebrews 12 verses 18 to 29. So the whole point of this glorious letter is to focus our attention on our glorious God in the person of Jesus Christ and that's what makes the letter glorious. I'm going to use that word glorious and glory a lot today because that's where we're going. I'm going to kind of bounce across the top of the passage to get to God's glory because that's what I think it's pointing at. So the, we've already said the whole letter was written to a community of Christians who were Jewish by birth and who were being tempted by those around them and by their natural instincts and of course by the enemy of our souls to turn back towards their Jewish traditions and rituals rather than focusing on Jesus and so living in the freedom that he has won for them and of course for us. So most of us here are not tempted to go back towards the Jewish religious system of trying to make up for the bad things we've done, the sins we've committed by sacrificing sheep and cows. But we have to be very aware that the enemy of our souls and our natural inclinations and desires and the whole world around us conspires to distract us from Jesus. When I'm talking about natural inclinations, I'm talking about the way we thought and our attitudes and our behaviours before we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. When we become saved, when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Saviour, everything changes for us spiritually. But for most of us, it takes a little while for our bodies and our emotions and our thinking to catch up with what has actually happened to us. So that's what I mean when I'm talking about natural inclinations. And so far, this letter has reminded us that Jesus is better than the angels, he's better than the patriarchs that were the historical heroes of the Jewish faith, and he's better than the Jewish law. Now, there were no problems with those things. They were all good things. But the thing is, if they distract us from Jesus, they become a problem to us. Anything that distracts us from Jesus is a problem. It might be a good thing in itself. Your, your fantastic job, your beautiful home, your you know, amazing hobby, even your family... They're all good things, but if they become more important to you than Jesus, it messes you up. And it causes us to sin, because sin starts in our hearts. The outward of the bits that we call sin, the slapping people and nicking things, is the kind of spots on the outside. Well, the sin starts in our heart, and the root of all sin <coughs> is a wrong attitude to God. That's right. And if we believe that the wrong things about God, like he's a big meanie, he's not interested in me, all the other things or people are more important than him, then it allows all sorts of rubbish into our lives. James 1.17 tells us every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. All good things come from God, so we want to be kind of hanging in there with God, really, don't we? Family, material blessings, and all the stuff that we have, and good health, and all that stuff, it's all good stuff. They're all part of our relationship with God. And he gives a lot of that to us, doesn't he, before we even become saved, because he's such an amazing, generous God that he loves us even when we're not interested in him. 
So that's all part of our relationship with God, but that's the thing, we need to see them in that light as part of our relationship with God. Um, again, Romans 8, 28 tells us that he, give, he, he didn't withhold his son from us, so he's going to give us everything. But we just need to keep the everything in perspective, otherwise it pulls us off course. So uh, again, in John 17, God, uh, Jesus says, life, eternal life, is knowing the Father. So that's where we're heading. So I just wanted to, I, to try and make this clearer. I wanted to give a little physical demonstration. If, if Jesus is up there at the back of the steps at the top, right in the middle, if I'm walking towards him up here, I'm doing good now. But if I get distracted and start going off here, it doesn't matter very much at this point. But by the time I get up here, I've crashed into the seats, haven't I? Yeah. And I can keep going. I could clamber over them and tread on a few people and knock the seats over and probably injure myself in the process. By the time I'm you know, the front of the <coughs> tiered seats, I'd probably be out the door and in the fountain, you know, I would not be getting on towards Jesus. So we yeah. don't need to be distracted from Jesus. So, I'm just going to tuck that away for a minute, and we're actually going to read the passage and, um, and go into the background of that. So, uh, it's Hebrews 12, verses 18 to 29. You, these are the Christians he's writing to, have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words so that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I'm trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God, you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. Woohoo! That's us, chaps. <coughs> you have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the word of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what has been shaken, that is, created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Amen. It's great. So it's great and there's loads in it. And as I say, I'm going to kind of bounce across the surface. <coughs> but that beginning passage about you've not come to a mountain that can be touched, that's burning with fire, refers to a really significant event in the history of Israel. So the Israelites have been living in Egypt for about 500 years. And for the last couple of hundred years, they've been made slaves in Egypt and they've been having a pretty horrendous time. So they cried out to God, and God sent Moses to lead them out of Egypt, and through a series of really spectacular miracles, God rescued the whole tribe of Israel out of their horrible situation. And about three months after this really amazing stuff all happened, the whole tribe, there were millions of them, arrived at Mount Sinai, a particular place, Mount Sinai, and God appeared to the Israelites in a really tangible way. He was, the earth was shaking, there was smoke and fire, and there was this great voice and trumpets. It was pretty amazing. And he, at that point, he gave them the law. So he gave them the Ten Commandments and a whole lot more of that, which is all set out in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Numbers. 
And the event itself is actually recorded in Exodus 19 and 20. And uh, it was a really significant event for the Israelites because it's when they stopped being a tribe and became a nation. But also, more importantly, God said to them, I've chosen you. Pretty amazing. In verses 4 to 6, he says, You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. You no, know, I'd be quite happy if God came to me and said, hey, I own the whole earth, but you are going to be mine and be a priest for me. That is pretty amazing. But Jesus is better. Jesus is better than that because at that point, although the Israelites were chosen by God, they couldn't actually go up the mountain into his very presence until they performed various rituals and God had actually said, okay, now you're ready, you can come up. And they, they had to do these rituals and wait for God to say now because they just weren't holy enough to get into God's presence. And that doesn't mean that God's a bit prissy. He's a bit like, oh, no, I don't want those dirty scrubbies. Yeah. <laughs> it's just that he is so holy and his holiness is so amazing and awesome that if we try and go up into his holiness and we're not holy, we get burnt up. And God loves us. He doesn't want us being burnt up. So they had to go through these rituals and wait for him to give them permission. But Jesus is better because as Christians who come under his covering, we get full access to our loving Heavenly Father all the time, anytime, whatever rubbish we get without any rituals. <laughs> Hebrews 4.16 says... Let us come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. And we get this because of what Jesus has done in dying on the cross for us. That is amazing. That he would come and die for us. I love Hebrews 1 verse 3. It talks about Jesus being the exact representation of God and that he's holding everything together by his word, and he came and saved us. You know, holding everything together by your word is pretty cool, isn't it? I think if I was holding everything together by my word, I probably wouldn't bother with coming and saving anyone. I'd be like, hey, this is cool enough, I'm quite enjoying this. It wasn't that he was too busy, <coughs> but it's amazing, isn't it, that he would come and save us. And the thing that we're talking about in comparing these two little bits of the passages, the first bit where you haven't come to the tangible mountain, you've come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, is it's two different covenants. We don't use the word covenant very much, apart from it's uh, in legal things often now. But we really don't have an equivalent these days, the, the closest thing we have to a covenant is really the marriage ceremony where we kind of join together, we take each other's names and we say whatever is of your interest is my interest, you know, what's good for you, I'll support that. That's what covenant meant. It meant we we're agreeing to really come together and whatever helps you I'll do and whatever helps me you'll do and we take each other's names. It was a really big deal. And in the Old Testament, there was this covenant where God said to them, as I've just read, if you keep my laws, that I will be your God. But this new covenant, God basically said, I'll keep both ends of the bargain, <coughs> chaps, because you just can't do it. Um, that's a very quick, there's loads and loads more to say on that, but that's a whole other sermon, so we'll come back to that another time. Just kind of get the gist of it, hopefully. So it's not that God was different in the Old Testament or that he got it wrong somehow. 
We know that salvation through Jesus was always the plan. Ephesians 1, 4 and 5 tells us that he chose us in Christ before the beginning of the world. And actually, as we look through the Old Testament, we can see that God was yearning for his people. He was a loving God that wanted to get up close with his people. There's a great verse in Leviticus 20, 26, where God's saying to the Israelites, you are to be holy because I am holy and I have set you apart from the nations to be my own. Hopefully in that you can hear the Lord's heart yearning for his people saying, please be holy because if you're not holy, I can't come up close to you because you'll get burnt up and I really want to come up close to you. And again, it's not that in, in the New Testament and in our times that God isn't interested in holiness, that he's not holy anymore because Jesus says in Matthew 5, 48, be perfect therefore as my heavenly father is perfect. Well, and holy. He has done it. So the whole point of the law was that it showed us that we cannot make ourselves holy. We cannot save ourselves. But the problem with the law <coughs> is it only dealt with the externals, the don't eat this, don't touch that, do keep that festival, do behave like this. And it didn't change us on the inside. We can all keep rules, can't we, without it actually affecting our heart, without us actually allowing God into our hearts. And it is our hearts that God is interested that's in. Right. Because that's where everything flows out of, isn't it? Out of our hearts. And he's interested in everything mm. and wants that loving relationship with us. But there was no point in Jesus dying for us until we had seen that we couldn't do it for ourselves. If we don't think we need a saviour, why would we be interested in one? Galatians 3.24 says, The law was schoolmaster put in charge to bring us to Christ. And boy, when I look inside, do I need a saviour? There's all that envy and insecurity and grumpiness and dishonesty and rubbish going on in there and I need Jesus. So he came to do for me and you what we cannot do for ourselves and no one else could have done it. Only a holy God can completely save us, make us whole. We just sang that, didn't we? He makes, he heals us, he makes me whole. Only a holy God can do that. Again, Hebrews 7.25 says, He is able to save completely those who came, come to him through God, or come to God through him. He can save us completely because he's holy. So holiness is still really important. And again, Hebrews 10.1 says rather wonderfully, The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming not the realities themselves. And in this passage that I read, verses 23 through to 24, they tell us we have come to those realities. It is just fabulous. We didn't come to the physical demonstration of God's glory. <coughs> Most of us have not had the experience of being somewhere in the whole place shaking and there being trumpet sounds and fire, but we've come to a spiritual experience that just because it's not tangible doesn't mean it was real. Actually, the spiritual is more real than the physical. And we, we, it carries on, doesn't it, this passage to say that God's going to shake out the things that are, are created, the tangible things that we see and touch and smell, and we're going to be left with the spiritual, the eternal things. So we have come to those realities, those spiritual realities. We have come to God. We have access to our Heavenly Father all the time. We have all the resources of heaven coming towards us, and we don't get burnt up when we, we go to claim them because we've been made righteous by what Jesus did. 
So as Christians, we are not trying to earn our righteousness or secure our place in God's affections by our good behaviour, because we've already got it all. So actually, it's seeing God that causes us to, the more we see of him, the more we fall in love with him, the more we want to actually make him look good to others by living the way he tells us to, by living in love and honesty and purity. And then he gets glorified, and that's the whole point. But we're still in that process, aren't we, that I referred to earlier, that process of our emotions and our will and everything catching up with the with these realities. And so sometimes we get deceived by our natural inclinations and by the world and by the enemy of our souls. And that takes us off course. So we need to be alert and to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. We need to measure up our attitudes against this, don't we? Yeah. Against God's manual for life here on earth. And one deception that I want to take a little pot shot at this morning is a very subtle twist, I think, on the truth. And I'm calling it the me-centred gospel. So the world would tell us, life is all about me, isn't it? Follow your heart. It's your dreams that matter. If it feels right, do it. And do not get me onto the whole Disney thing of, if you believe in yourself enough, you can do everything. Okay. It's true. It's absolutely true isn't it? that we are unique. We are made in the image of God. That as Christians, although we might be a bit rubbishy and broken on the outside, we have this amazing treasure of God on the inside. It's all true that God loves us absolutely just as we are with all our inadequate what have you, and Jesus came to save us. That is all wonderfully, gloriously true. Yeah. And we need to get it. We really need to get it deep down in our souls so that it becomes the very rock that we build our entire lives on. But we also need to understand that that's the beginning, not the end. The end is the glory of God. Right not us. Jesus came to save us for the glory of God. Um, you can look that up in 1 Ephesians. It says several times about the, Jesus came to save us for the glory of God. And in um, John 17, just before he goes to the cross, when Jesus is praying, he says, Father, it's time for you to glorify me that I may glorify you. It's all about the glory of God. And of course, we can't really separate the fact that Jesus loves us, that he came to save us from that glory. It is all part of it. He loves us so much that he would rather die than live without us. That is astounding. I have no words for that. A God who could create the whole universe just by speaking and who is so holy and save all people everywhere throughout time by dying for them would love me enough to come just blows me away but it is about his glory and I, I'm really sorry because I don't really understand what I'm saying this morning. I haven't really got this full revelation of God's glory and how we fit into that but I just know it is glorious and when we get it it is going to be so much more, more glorious than we imagine because God keeps giving doesn't he always there's always more he just keeps giving all the time so please do not hear in what i just said that god is more interested in himself than he is in you because actually he's besotted with you and do not hear that he's got more important things to do than to be interested in you because then otherwise we've got to grab his attention, haven't we, by being terribly, terribly good and saying lots and lots and lots of really long prayers with all the right words, haven't we, just to get his attention. <laughs> but actually, yeah. Psalm 139 tells us his thoughts towards us outnumber the sand. You can't possibly count them. Amen. So that is not what I'm saying at all. And 
you need to camp in this understanding that God loves you and came to stay with you and is pleased with you as you are until you get it. But camp there knowing that there is a bigger, higher, wider, deeper, longer aspect of God's love for you that is coming and it's going to be even more glorious. The trouble is that if we think the gospel's all about us, we may not hear God when he speaks to us. Like it says here, see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If it's all about us and he, God says something to us that's a little bit uncomfortable, we might discard it, wouldn't it? Why, why would God, you know, it's all about me, why would God, wouldn't want that, would he? Or we might become cynical. Like, well, why would, why would God say that? He hasn't told me that, so it can't be true, can it? If he hasn't told me, because I'm the centre of everything, it can't be true, can it? We become cynical and disregard things. And the trouble with the event that the first few verses in this passage refer to, the event of Mount Sinai, is that at that time, when God did say to the Israelites, okay, come up now, come up into my presence, the Israelites were so freaked out by God's holiness that they wouldn't come. They said, oh yes, we'll obey everything you say, we will, we will, but actually Moses, would you go and talk to the Lord and then tell him what, listen to what he says and then come back and tell us. So we might say, oh, that's pretty really good, isn't it, really? They were being quite humble, and, uh, and they were willing to obey, but actually they weren't accepting everything God wanted to give them. They were giving it a little twist, weren't we? Well, you know, it, it sounds quite good, but we don't like that bit in it, so we won't have it quite like that. We'll have it as we want it. And they missed out on so much. And they started, as I said, they started here, going in roughly the right direction. But because they were twisting it a little bit, they got out of sync. And we hear them doing all sorts of crazy things, don't we? In fact, only 40 days later, 40 days, the whole thing got out of hand and they had to go into exile and all that sort of jazz. And we do not want to go into exile. <laughs> we just don't want to get there. So we need to be focused on Jesus and not focused on the worldly stuff because this passage tells us all the worldly stuff is going to be shaken out and the only thing that will remain is the eternal, the spiritual, and that's what we want. Life, eternal life, is knowing God and we want to know him in all his glory. So, it is knowing God that makes us grateful for what he's done for us and so causes us to worship him acceptably in reverence and awe and I would commend that to you. But that's all I want to say now, so thank you. <laughs>